Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me begin by recognizing uh, my partners in the endeavor that is the Strauss Center, uh, Zahava and Michelle Strauss. It's wonderful to be here with you this evening. I want to recognize the presence of the members of the Strauss Center's Academic Advisory Committee who are here tonight. Uh, Stern College's Dean Karen Bacon, Yeshiva College's Dean Barry Eichler, and uh, Dr. David Schatz. I want to thank uh, Rabbi Reese as well for joining us. I want to thank the Strauss Center's Assistant Director for Operations, Stu Halpern, for all his work for tonight's event and for all that we do. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Strauss Center's third great conversation on religion and democracy. An initiative begun in tandem with our academic theme for the year, Jewish Ideas and American Democracy. I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our guest tonight, the perfect person to partake in a conversation on this evening's topic, religion and ethics in an age of terror. And that is the Honorable Judge Michael Mukasey. Nominated to the federal bench, Nominated to the federal bench for the Southern District of New York by President Ronald Reagan in 1988. Judge Mukasey served as a judge for 18 years, his final six years as Chief Judge of the Southern District. Throughout his tenure, he presided over some of the most significant national security cases of our age. Because of his distinguished service on the judiciary, our guest was known as such an embodiment of integrity and beloved by so many that when he was nominated by President Bush in 2007 to serve as the Attorney General of the United States, America heard an outpouring of praise from everyone who knew him, from every part of his life. From decades of his clerks, we were told in a letter to the Senate Judiciary Committee that, quote, the judge is kind, caring, loyal, ethical, and modest, with a disarming wit and a robust sense of humor. He was a wonderful teacher, sharing with us his insights into life, law, and lawyering from the lawyer for the defense in two terrorism trials. We were told that, quote, Judge Mukasey's sense of fairness and due process, it's more than intellectual, it's really down to the genetic level, it's in his DNA, end quote. United States Attorney in Manhattan under President Clinton, Mary Jo White, said upon the appointment that Mr. Mukasey would bring, quote, instantaneous institutional respect to the Justice Department because of how he is, who he is, and what he is. from the appeals court following the most famous trial over which Judge McKenzie presided, which we'll be discussing this evening, the trial of the blind sheikh. The appeals court said, quote, the trial judge, the Honorable Michael B. Mukasey, presided with extraordinary skill and patience, assuring fairness to the prosecution and to each defendant and helpfulness to the jury. His was an outstanding achievement in the face of challenges, far beyond those normally endured by a trial judge. Now, the one less than flattering thing that I've been able to uncover uh, from the whole host of praise which emerged in the media following Judge Mukasey's nomination was from uh, someone who has known Judge Mukasey for a very long time and is actually one of his biggest fans. And that's from my boss, Rabbi Haskell Lukstein, who has known Judge Mukasey since grade school and who told the media that, quote, Judge Mukasey wasn't the greatest at sports he was usually the last one picked for athletic teams, but he tried really hard, end quote. Now, Judge Mukasey, I would add, has strenuously denied this and insisted that he was quite good at baseball. Judge Mukasey, is that correct? Well, good, good field, light hit. Okay, well, that's way ahead of me, Judge Mukasey. And uh, you'll be delighted to know, in fact, uh, uh, Judge Mukasey, that upon further uh, interrogation, uh, Rabbi Lukstein has admitted uh, that he was only speaking about basketball. Uh, so, uh, Where I was and remain vertically challenged. Yes, indeed. So, uh, but you are still a man of great stature in our eyes, Judge McKenzie. Now, now uh, Rabbi Lukstein also told the media upon Judge McKenzie's nomination that, quote, he has always been one of the finest, most moral, and most analytical people I have known, and he was the best choice Bush could have made, picking someone with such moral clarity. Andrew McCarthy, the prosecutor of the Blind Sheik trial, wrote that President Bush has had to make many tough decisions, but naming Michael Mukasey Attorney General of the United States was not one of them, though it will surely be remembered as one of the best decisions he made. We convened this conversation with Judge Mukasey in the week of Purim. When I raised the possibility of connecting our event to Purim, the Attorney General responded enthusiastically and noted that his own Hebrew name is Mordechai. 
Now, he would not, however, assent to my request to advertise this event as a conversation with United States Attorney General Mordechai Mukasey. <laughs> Be that as it may, given the genuine love and respect that our guest has received from so many, we can certainly apply to our guest tonight words from the concluding verses of the Megillah. Ki Mordechai Hayudi Mishnel Amelech. For Mordechai the Jew was a minister to the leader of our age. Vigadol by Yehudim. He was a great man among the Jews. Ratsui Larov Echov. Beloved by his brethren. Doresh Tov Liamo. He sought the good of the nation he served. Vidover Shalom Lechol Zaro. And he will be known as an agent of peace, security, and well being for his posterity. Please join me in welcoming to the Strauss Center our own Mordechai Hayehudi. Former United States Attorney General, the Honorable Judge Michael Mukasey. Uh, Judge Mukasey, let's begin by drawing a bit of a timeline for the members of the audience. In 1989, a group of Islamic radicals, uh, including El Sayyid Nosser, Mahmoud Abu Halima, Mohammed Salama, Nidal Ayad, and others, were observed by the FBI in paramilitary training in Calverston, Long Island. These men were confronted, these men actually noticed that they were being surveyed, that they were under surveillance. They confronted the FBI, claimed their rights were being violated, and amazingly the FBI just backed off. In spring of 1990, they reported their training activities to their religious leader, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, then living in Egypt. Soon after, the blind Sheikh arrives to, uh, he's known as the blind Sheikh. Soon after, the blind Sheikh arrives to live in the United States, incredibly, Despite his record of affiliation with terrorism and the assassination of Anwar Sadat, he is still given a visa and then a green card in the U.S. Then, in 1991, Nosser... As a, as a religious worker. Right? As a religious worker, yes, for, as a clergyman. Uh, in 1991, one of these men, Nosser, kills Mayor Kahana in New York. He is then acquitted of murdering Kahana, but convicted of firing the gun used to murder Mayor Kahana. Literature was seized from only, only in the New York State courts. That's right, exactly. Um, literature was seized from his apartment, which discussed, among other things, toppling tall buildings in order to bring down Western civilization. In 1992, Nocera communicates to others visiting him in prison that future bombing plans require the approval of the blind sheikh. In February 1993, members of that group drive a van into the parking garage of the World Trade Center. That van explodes, murdering six people injuring hundreds of others, causing millions of dollars of property damage. Four terrorists are tried for that bombing. In August of 1993, Sheikh al-Rahman, Nosser, and many others are then indicted on charges including seditious conspiracy, bombing, consp uh, bombing conspiracy for their plans to bomb both the World Trade Center and other landmarks, as well as their conspiracy to murder Mubarak in Egypt and for murdering Mayor Kahana. In 1995, following a nine-month trial, the blind sheikh and Nosser are sentenced to life in prison by Judge Michael Mukasey. How am I doing so far? Yeah. So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. At his sentencing, Judge Mukasey tells the blind sheikh that had he succeeded, he and his cohorts would have caused, quote, devastation on a level not seen in this country since the Civil War. It is, this from, it is now from jail that the blind sheikh issues a fatwa that provided Osama bin Laden with a theological justification for the next act of terror against the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Now at the time of the Blind Sheikh trial, Judge Mukasey, it was assumed that terrorism could be treated like any other crime, prosecuted in a regular court proceeding like any other. As you've noted in your own writings, the response to the 93 bombing was the conventional response, bring the perpetrators to justice in court. In fact, the case over which you presided was shown as the very model, held up as the very model, that this could be accomplished. In retrospect, what, if anything, was wrong with prosecuting terrorists this way? What are you proud of, and what do you wish had been done differently? Pride doesn't really enter into it. Um, I, like any other judge, followed the rules and simply tried to treat that trial as I would have treated any other trial. Um, because if you deviate from that formula, then you wind up doing what my colleague did on the West Coast, um, the person who tried the O.J. Simpson case. Right. A much more famous trial going on at the same time, right. I might add. Um, yeah. Possibly the only person who can say that he had O.J. Simpson running interference for him. Right. <laughs> um, the, um, I think the, the, 
the mistake, and it's hard, to, it's hard to say that it was a mistake because nobody knew at the time what was really going on, um, was not to see this as, um, as a worldwide problem, not to see it as a uh, problem of war against the United States, but to see it as a crime. And given that it was a crime, then it was tried conventionally in a, in a, in a court. But writ large, that formula uh, can't work um, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way of, of uh, as, or as the only response uh, to what is a war against this country. Why is that? Problems of scale, uh, problems of proof, um, and um, it, it, it is, it is a, a, a military effort that requires a military response. So what, did anything emerge from the trial or in the process of the trial itself that actually facilitated or helped uh, terrorists who were currently, or were then plotting against the United well, States? we didn't know it at the time, but um, as in all conspiracy cases, the government um, in, its, in the indictment charged that the crime was committed by the identified persons um, and others to the grand jury known and unknown. And the usual, the, the standard requirement in such cases is that the government serve a list of unindicted co-conspirators. That is, who, is the, who are the other people who uh, you say participated in this who have not been indicted, who are known to the government? And the government served a three-page list of people. One of those people uh, was Osama bin Laden. Nobody ever heard of him at the time. We later found out, later being several years later, that that list, within two weeks of the time that it was served, found its way to bin Laden in Khartoum, where he was then living uh, in the Sudan. And um, he, as a result, not only knew that he was known, but he knew who else among his conspirators were known to the government and was able to take countermeasures. So actual disclosures at your trial helped him avoid U.S. surveillance? I don't know that it helped him avoid U.S. surveillance, but it certainly informed him about who it was who was then known to the government. Now, the prosecutors in this case uh, recount that it was very difficult for them to actually find a law under which to sufficiently try all those engaged in this conspiracy to bomb both the World Trade Center and other landmarks uh, in the tri-state area. In the end, the crime under which they convicted them, under which you sentenced them, Seditious Conspiracy was written in the 1860s uh, for uh, the Civil War, for Americans sympathetic with Confederacy working against the United States. And that was certainly creative, and you allowed that. Did that strike you as strange at the time? And has anything changed legally now that allows for greater tools to prosecute terrorists? Well, there are, there are specific terrorism statutes now in place uh, that go more directly to, that speak more directly to, to, the, to these particular crimes. But I didn't think that it was particularly adventuresome at the time, nor do I think so now, to use the seditious conspiracy statute. Um, murder statutes are even older than that. Right. Um, so it, I mean, it was a statute that barred um, a, a, a criminal agreement to act against the United States or to make war against the United States um, in, a, in, a, in a violent way. And um, the, there, were, there was nothing, there was nothing ill-fitting about, about the prosecution. Now, it was during this trial that you and your family began to live under federal protection. Is that correct? Right. Now, to the best that you can and are just, willing just to... Just before. Just before. Right. Did you have... They told you that this was necessary, that this was something that you would have to do? Well, as I, as I recall it, um, it started... The, the protection of the judges involved in these cases started with, with uh, Judge Duffy, who had the, the four defendants... Um, you mentioned. And uh, when that trial ended, then my trial was going to be next, and I was told, well, it's, it's, now, you know, it's now your turn in the barrel. Um, and I was told initially that we were doing it on a trial basis. And um, after seven or eight weeks, I stopped ending when, I stopped asking when the, when the trial basis was going to end and caught on to the fact that it wasn't going to end anytime soon. And to, to the best that you can or willing to describe, what did you know about death threats against you? Could you have responded by not taking this case? And how did this protection change your life? I could have, I suppose. Um, the, um, I don't know anything about serious death threats, and I made it my business not to find out. Um, um, but um, I think it changes your life because you have people with you for 
within um, within an intercom away um, 24 hours a day, which tends to make you a little bit self-conscious. Um, among other things, my wife and I couldn't have an argument. Um, <laughs> Certainly not, not an audible one, and definitely not in the car, which is a, a favorite venue for having spousal <laughs> arguments. Would you recommend the federal protection then for a lot of couples? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Achieve marital bliss by having this, this, right. We should write a book on this, Judge McKay. This, this, this could be a bestseller. Now, um, in the end, you sentenced the blind chief to life in prison. That being the maximum sentence you were able to impose. Right. There was no at the time there was no death penalty in effect for for terrorists. Would you have liked to have a legal option sentence him to death? Liked. Um, Preferred. I thought the option should have been available. You you've raised some eyebrows by suggesting the terrorists involved in 9/11. I mean, understand who we're dealing with. Right. This this person um, still has totemic significance within um, w within the, the, right. the Islamist movement, uh, within the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. He is still the subject of pressure uh, for release. Indeed, he was the subject of pressure for release while I was Attorney General. I'll tell you a little bit later about a, right. an amusing incident I had with the, the Attorney General of Qatar who wanted to get him out. Um, but um, he was also well on his way to becoming an Egyptian Khomeini, and he had tape recordings, just the way Khomeini did before he came to power in Iran. And uh, his aspirations were very strongly in that direction, and he had a very strong following. It's actually just recently, uh, just recently several Americans are being held prisoner in Egypt, including the son of the current Secretary of Transportation, uh, were released, and some Egyptian media outlets have reported that these might have been done in response to a promise by the current administration to release the blind sheikh. Do you give any credence to these reports? Or? What, what is your reaction no. to that? Um, it, would be, it would be an incredible blunder. Um. Now, you've given the fact, as you say, that he, the blind sheikh continues to have totemic significance, as you said. Um, it was reported that you yourself suggested that um, some of the terrorists involved in 9-11 should not be executed because that would make them martyrs. Yeah, that, 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 was, that was an academic joke. Um, oh, so not true at all, in other words. True, uh, literally true. This happened at the London School of Economics where I made the mistake in an academic setting um, of making an academic joke. I said that um, there was one good reason that I could think of not to impose the death penalty on them, and that had to do with the conversation between the sadist and the masochist. Uh, Masochist says, hit me, and a sadist says, no. Um, and because it would make, because they, 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 they wanted to be martyrs, and therefore it would be more exquisitely um, cruel to them um, not to give them martyrdom. But that said, in the next sentence, I said they were, in fact, poster children, every single one of them, for the death penalty. And it, you know, but the, that part got left off, and the first part got. So you think that might actually that should be considered by the government, certainly in in terms of oh goodness, yeah, the prosecution, absolutely. absolutely. Now, um, uh, given what you just said, given the blind, the fact the blind sheikh himself continued to pass messages out while in jail. Actually, his lawyer was then prosecuted for actually passing messages out. Um, and given what you just said, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the fact that Israel today still has no death penalty for terrorists. Um, many suggest that following the, the trade of Gilad, for Gilad Shalit, uh, that Israel would have been better off had it had a death penalty for terrorists. Um, does the fact that they don't have a death penalty for anyone except Nazi criminals make any moral or strategic sense in your view? The last thing in the world that I'm going to do right. is sit here and second guess the Israeli government about what's best for them. Right. Um, that said, um, yes, they would have been better off if <laughs> um, a number of the people who were released um, in return for Gilad Shalit could not be released um, because they were dead. So let's fast forward a couple of years now after you've sentenced a group of terrorists for, in part, for conspiring to bring down the World Trade Center. 
Now on September 11, 2001, that actually occurs. Where are you on that day? And at that moment, what goes through your mind? Well, um, I'm in a doctor's office, as a matter of fact, and um, coming out of a, a procedure, and um, my wife and daughter walked in, and I thought they were there to provide moral support. And um, they told me what had happened, that by that time, two planes had hit the Trade Center. Um, I had protection at the time. This was in 2001. My trial had ended in 95. I still had, I had marshals. And um, I asked, I asked the, the, the marshal who was um, heading the detail, is this our guys? And he said, yes. Um, By our guys, you meant those linked to? Yes. Yeah. To, and what the blind sheikh, the group with which he had been affiliated, morphed into what became Al-Qaeda, essentially. Is that? I, that's a little bit strong. Um, yeah. I think that what we're talking about really is a movement that started, um, if you want to go back, um, it started in, in the 1920s in Egypt. So my own timeline was insufficient. In other words. Well, I, that wasn't insufficient, um, but um, it started in, 1920, in, in the 1920s uh, with a man named um, uh, Hassan al-Banna, uh, who started the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, one of his disciples was a man named Sayyid Qutb, who um, in, I think it was 1948, um, got, a, got a traveling fellowship uh, that was designed to get him out of Egypt. He, he was awarded a traveling fellowship because they wanted to get him out of Egypt. Um, he, was, he was raised, making a great deal of trouble, and so he left Egypt. And he, unfortunately, he, he traveled to the United States. Uh, and in particular, he, he traveled to Greeley, Colorado. Um, now, Greeley, Colorado, after World War II, was probably about as tame a place as he could possibly be in. Um, but he thought it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, there were men and women sitting next to each other in church, and there was jazz music and short haircuts and sports and all sorts of horrible things. And um, he was scandalized. And um, he believed that the culture in which he lived was decadent and evil um, and had to be brought down. And so he went back to Egypt, began to agitate, and um, eventually was um, executed uh, by the Nasser, by Nasser. He, when Nasser came to power, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and Qutb were, were very happy because they thought that he would institute Sharia law and turn Egypt into a, into a, into a theocracy, um, but was disappointed when he didn't even, didn't even ban alcohol. Um, and eventually wound up being executed uh, by Nasser when there was a crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Qutb's brother, um, and a number of others then scattered. Most of them went to Saudi Arabia, where um, Qutb's brother taught uh, two people of note. Um, one is a man named Ayman al Zawari, who is now uh, the head of Al Qaeda. Current leader of Al Qaeda. Right, and the other was the pampered son of a wealthy Saudi construction family bin Laden. named Osama bin Laden. And the rest, as they say, is history. So it Really wasn't. It wasn't just a question of morphing into Al Qaeda. By our guys, in other words, you mean uh, men in the large Islamist large. extremists. Oh, so that brings us to the next very sensitive subject. So the topic of our conversation is religion and ethics in an age of terror. Now, in, in the case over which you presided, the blind sheikh was not merely a racketeering re ringleader or a mafioso godfather. He was a, a religious leader. His followers would not engage in an attack without his. Permission is that what well, he would give it in a cagey way, but that is he would give the permission. Is that correct? And is that is that's well, that's he, how it works. He, um, as I recall, the testimony was that his advice uh, to his followers when they were talking about whether to take action against the United States was, um, quote, "Don't just let the water run," right. meaning don't do something that's just going to hurt the water company. Do something spectacular. And um, in fact, there were taped. Some of the conversations were taped because this conspiracy was infiltrated by an informant. And um, there were debates about whether it was permissible to steal a car so that explosives could then be put in the car and it could be brought into the middle of the Holland and Lincoln tunnels um, and left to explode. So that was their moral question whether they could steal the car. In other right. The, the, answer, the answer to that, Shiloh, was it was permissible. So he, that was their psaak, right. in other words. Right. Psaak was, was it was permissible to steal the car. Right. It didn't come from him. Right. 
they sort of reasoned that out by themselves. The most amazing thing, actually, I'll just add while I was researching this and reading about this, is that one of the ways they caught one of the people who drove the van into the World Trade Center is that he came back several times to the ride or rental location for his deposits. Yeah, he... Um, which the, I just found the, unbelievable. The, the 93, right. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed Salameh. Um, it, it was such a shoestring operation that he didn't have enough money to buy an airline ticket out. So he had to go back and try to get the deposit. And by that time, the FBI had discovered the, the VIN number of the car right. and knew where it had been rented. And when he called up to come and get his deposit, the person behind the, uh, the desk was an FBI agent, and they filmed the whole thing. And at one point, he was arguing for getting his deposit back in spite of the fact that he couldn't produce the truck. And um, <laughs> he said, uh, I just want justice. And the attendant, who of course was an FBI agent, said, oh, you'll get justice, all right? <laughs> so he never got his $400 on the side. Didn't He might have gotten it briefly, <laughs> very briefly. <laughs> now, uh, so the fact is, he is, as it were, you used a, you know, it's a, uh, the phrase, like the posake, in other words. He's, he's, he's giving them, he's telling them what to do with the different moral and religious decisions, as it were. You could steal he, gave general, he gave general guidance. General the, guidance. The, the standard that the jury applied was that they had to find that he knew and that they knew that his authorization was an authorization to, among other things, commit murder. Right. Uh, and they found beyond a reasonable doubt that it was. That he did that. Now here's, you, you recently said the following, quote, I recognize that all religions, my own included, have universal, universalist visions and look forward to the day when all people worship in accordance with them. But where they differ sharply is on how far they command people to go in bringing that day about. For the people in charge to overlook that, or if they have not overlooked it, to try to get other people to overlook it, is, I suggest to you, a bad way to lead us. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that simply was that when our leaders, or some of them, um, take the view that they don't want to refer to our adversary as Islamist or as being inspired by Islam, um, but fear that if they do that, um, that they will, they will be doing something politically incorrect and will be labeled intolerant and so on. Um, for them to, to do that um, is to overlook precisely what it is we're dealing with um, and to blind everybody else to the problem and to make it that much more difficult to fight the problem. So you would apply that to, let's say, when a bombing fails in Times Square and our mayor theorizes that that may have just been some right somebody, winger right, somebody, upset about the health care. Somebody was right, disappointed about the health care bill. He, right. offered to, to, he offered to, as I recall, he offered to wager the munificent sum of 25 cents, right. which when you consider his net worth is really... <laughs> Not a very strong bet. Not anyways. a very strong bet. Um, would you extend, though, that criticism to your former boss as well, meaning to the administration for which you worked. And for example, this is before you worked for the administration, but immediately after 9-11, we were told that these uh, terrorists were traitors to their faith, which was a religion of peace. We heard that a lot. Love and peace, if I recall correctly. Yeah. The, the then National Security Director, later Secretary of State, said it was a religion of love and peace. Um, I don't know how much reading she had done before she said that. So you would extend that criticism to that as well? To, to Yes. Now, um, continuing along this timeline, let's turn to interrogation. So soon after September 11th, the American campaign in Afghanistan began, in short, leading to the capture of three major al-Qaeda leaders, Abu Zubaydah, Ramzi al-Sheib, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's known as the mastermind of 9-11. In a series of now famous or infamous memos, in 2002 by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, uh, John Yu, uh, working on those memos, the conclusion was reached that the Geneva Conventions, as well as our own federal law banning torture, would not prohibit the government engaging in what ended up being called enhanced interrogation techniques. Now you've called the term enhanced interrogation techniques the worst case of branding since New Coke. Now what did you mean by that? And would forcing someone to drink New Coke be a violation of the Geneva Convention? Um, you can reflect on that as well. Actually, New Coke, was, as I recall, was very similar to Pepsi, and which I kind of like, so I, oh, sorry I don't to think it would violate the yeah. Geneva Convention. But um, what I meant by that was simply that 
insofar as it suggested that what was being referred to was something that was so horrible that it couldn't be accurately described as harsh, which it was, and coercive, which it was, which would have been a whole lot better. But instead, a weasel term like enhanced interrogation techniques, which made it sound like a, a wash day product or a better toothpaste. Um, I thought that was a huge mistake because what it suggested to people was that something unspeakably bad and probably illegal was being done, neither of which was true. So they should have just come out and said openly... Harsh interrogation techniques. Harsh inter now these include what? Sleep deprivation? Sleep deprivation. Walling, Walling. which is, involves banging someone into... Banging somebody into a hollow wall that he doesn't know is hollow uh, and makes a huge sound as if he is being banged a lot harder than he in fact right. is. Um, it includes slapping somebody in the side of the head um, or on and, the abdomen. And waterboarding. And waterboarding. And what waterboarding is simulating the experience of drowning. Is that, is that what it is or is that not an accurate description? It's not an accurate description. How um, I'll tell you precisely what it is. Yeah. It, it, it involves laying somebody down on um, a, um, a tilted bench, uh, putting a cloth over his face and pouring water over his nose and mouth for a period of between 20 and 40 seconds, um, being careful to do it at a time when he has to take a breath. That is, if he holds his breath, he wait until he has to take a breath and then pour the water. No longer than 40 seconds at a, at a, at a, at a time. Um, and doing that over a period of minutes. All with a doctor in attendance. Now, when you were having not given him a special diet beforehand so that if he happened to take any of the water in, um, it wouldn't make him vomit. Now, when you were nominated as Attorney General, there were some senators who opposed your nomination because of your refusal to say whether waterboarding was torture or not. I didn't know right. what, I, what I just disclosed, by the way. You I could not know. have disclosed. Ha at, I certainly couldn't have disclosed it at the time because right. I didn't know it. Because that brings me to um, so even after the program was discontinued when you were Attorney General, right. you refused to opine on the subject. So because, it was, because it was discontinued. So, so why did you refuse then, and knowing what you now know, what's your view on waterboarding in general and the way that it was used in Al-Qaeda operatives? Um, I, what I said at the time during, during the hearing was that I would look at the memos and determine for myself, as I did, whether any of the memos, um, whether the techniques that were set forth in the memos, the memos were known to exist, the techniques were not known. They were classified, and they should have, in my view, stayed classified. Um, but that I would examine the memos and then reach a conclusion about whether anything unlawful had been done. And um, I went about that, in, I mean, this was not my idea, it was a pretty interesting way, with the help of two other people, um, neither of whom knew who the other was, both of whom had access to the memos, and so that I could do it not just myself, but with the assistance of two other lawyers in, in the department. This is right when you became Attorney General? Yes, um, first two months or so. And um, I then found out that we were no longer doing it, that it had stopped, in fact, in 2003, which was four years before I got there. Why, why was it stopped? It stopped because it wasn't necessary. Also because, to a certain extent, there was a lot of controversy was starting to begin. But um, it wasn't necessary. We knew, we learned a great deal about Al-Qaeda, and there was nobody in custody at beginning in 2003 who warranted the application of those techniques and who resisted to the point where they had to be used. In other words, the people that I just mentioned had already been fully interrogated to they, the extent that was necessary. Right. They, the three were Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and a man named Nashiri. Who, um, Those are the three who are waterboarded. Right. And as best as we know, or what you can tell us, where did those acts of enhanced interrogation take place? Don't know. Not in Guantanamo. Not in Guantanamo. Nobody was ever waterboarded at Guantanamo. So it's just no. anywhere, somewhere. Right. Guantanamo is, I mean, I, I visited Guantanamo when I was AG. How, um, was, the, how was the trip? Um, the trip was actually, the trip was actually interesting. Um, First of all, it compares favorably with, forget maximum security, but medium security facilities that I visited when I was a federal judge. Um, in fact, when I went down there, I was able to see um, all of the, um, 
the high value detainees, the people who were participating, in, were charged with participating in 9-11 and, and, and others, except for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was out of his cell uh, because he was meeting with a visiting delegation from the International Committee of the Red Cross so they could complain about his treatment. Um, I got to visit his, his cell and found that he had adjacent to it an exercise room in which he had an elliptical machine that was the same make and model as the one that I used at the Landsberg where I then lived, except that he didn't have to get up at five in the morning and wait his turn um, to use the machine. Um, in fact, the, um, the meals um, were highly nutritious. And that's not to say that there wasn't violence at uh, Guantanamo, there was plenty of it, but it was all directed by the prisoners at the guards, not the other way around. So there was no enhanced interrogation at Guantanamo? Itself. No. Not at all? No. But let's push, I want to get back to Guantanamo, but let's push the issue of, of interrogation a bit more. So leaving aside the question, so you've read the, you've read the memos. Yes. And then you come Anybody to Anybody here, by the way, can now read them. Now, when, when were they released? By the, by the Obama administration? They were released in April of 2009. Why? Um, I don't have the mind reading um, uh, booth on the Midway, so I can't. But I, why do I think they were released? Um, I think they were released in the belief that they would uh, generate such outrage uh, that there would be a desire to um, charge anybody who was responsible for creating them. And in point of fact... You mean John Yu, et cetera? Yes. Um, who, were, by the way, was then had been the subject of an inquiry by the, um, the Office of, of Professional Responsibility within the Justice Department while I was Attorney General. And when you read these memos immediately and you become Attorney General, do you, what conclusion do you draw about waterboarding and its legal status? It was, it was entirely legal under the statutes as they existed at the time, at the time being 2003. The only statute that read on anything involved in enhanced interrogation was the, the torture statute. And that was from the 90s, that torture statute? The torture statute was, goes back a lot further. The latest iteration of it, I think, was, was, um, was, was just before, was, was in the 90s. And how does that define torture? It defines torture as acting under color of law, so as to cause, with the intent to cause, severe physical or mental pain or suffering. That's the formulation. Severe, not just pain or suffering, but severe physical or mental pain or suffering Mental pain or suffering is defined, and it's defined in durational terms. That is, it can't be anything transitory. Uh, physical, severe physical pain or suffering is not defined. Now, uh, you said in the hearing itself that were something to be torture, then it would be absolutely illegal in all circumstances. Yes. Is, that, is that correct? Now, let's push that just a bit more. It, it, isn't it conceivable that torture would be necessary at any time? Uh, it, you, you said... You said it's not constitutional, this you said in the hearing, for the United States to engage in torture in any form. What? That's, that, that's, that's, I said that's it wasn't your, constitutional? I'm, uh, that's the quote I have, oh, but, mm. uh, but maybe I'm wrong. No, uh, maybe, but maybe I was wrong. Uh, now, suppose, now, these are, these are discussed in ethics cases, right? We, the Israelis call it a ticking time bomb case. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a favorite of, of law school. Right. But the Israelis have a name for it because there are parallels, not with necessarily a nuclear bomb in the middle of New York City, but um, let me just quote Charles Krauthammer, who wrote, the nuclear scale in the ticking time bomb case is hypothetical, but in the age of the car and suicide bomber, terrorists are often captured who have just set a car bomb to go off or sent a suicide bomber out to a coffee shop. In 1994, a 19-year-old Israel Corporal Nachshon Waxman was kidnapped by Palestinian terrorists. And, according to Krauthammer at least, the Israelis captured the driver of the car used in the kidnapping and after what we'll, we'll call enhanced interrogation, uh, but was not, it was actually severe. Uh, so Krauthammer writes, um, they actually discovered where Waxman was being held. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, who ordered that at the time, admitted, writes Krauthammer, that they tortured him in a way that went beyond the 1987 guidelines for coercive interrogation later struck down by the Israeli Supreme Court as too harsh. The driver talked and his information was accurate. So if we apply that to our case, even in such a case where there really is a real d dire need for such severe action, to use the full 
brutal words that are necessary without any fake advertising. Is it still not within the constitutional authority of the President of the United States to order somebody to seek this intelligence? It's within, it's within the President's constitutional power um, to direct that it be sought. Um, if he comes to me and says, am I acting lawfully by ordering that somebody be tortured in a way that violates the torture statute, I have to say no. And On the other hand, I didn't think, and still don't think, um, that it would have been necessary, given waterboard, right? Which no. isn't which isn't waterboard, and right? And is, and is very effective. Right. Now, um, uh, but under a 2005 law, which is known as the McCain Amendment, uh, all forms of coercive interrogation were banned. No. Would that include waterboarding or not? Don't that know. Would, I didn't have to opine on that, and decided yeah. that I wouldn't because waterboarding wasn't being used. I see. Notably, the Senate had a chance, not once but twice. Right. to vote on whether to ban waterboarding explicitly. And they refused. And both times refused. They preferred to put it in terms like, in, I think under the McCain Amendment, it's um, um, I don't have the exact formulation. Is degrading and right. et cetera. Um, I mean, they, they use very general right. terms that don't tell you specifically what the standards are. Um, now, McCain himself, when asked about the possibility that interrogators might have a need then to break the very law that he was writing, suggested that maybe they'll have to do that, but then they'll take responsibility. They'll have to take responsibility for it. On the other hand, there have been suggestions from legal writers from both sides of the aisle, Alan Dershowitz and Andrew McCarthy, who you know well, um, that we should have a system allowing for what Dershowitz called torture warrants when necessary, issued by a special judge. Others, like Krauthammer, would prefer specific legal exceptions built into the law for ticking time bomb or for slower fuse, high-level terrorists like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Each contingency would having its own set of rules, in other words. So which of these approaches do you think makes the most sense? Shouldn't we have some built-in legal way of dealing with those types of cases? Or, or can you tell me, or maybe you My can, own view but, is yeah. that we did before the passage of um, both the Detainee Treatment Act and um, the Military Commissions Act, each of which contains a set of these general standards. And I don't know whether any of the techniques that were used up until 2003 violates that statute because I never analyzed it under that statute, under those statutes. Um, um, but, but those statutes still viol ban torture, though, right? Or, meaning they don't have to. There, don't was, have a, there was a pre-existing torture statute, and that does ban torture. Yes. And there is no, for even for a ticking time bomb scenario. There's no anyway, even there for. Is, the, the, there is the no legal. Says, right. The statute says acting under color of law so as to cause severe physical or mental pain or suffering. Right. It's a crime. It's not a crime if, it's a crime, period. And we should not build in any exception no. to that law in your no. view. Um, and you don't think it will come up? or No, I don't. You don't that, I don't. Yeah. Um, now, um, it's interesting to talk yeah. about in this yeah. kind of a setting, right. but I don't think it presents a real-life problem. At all. In other at words, all. At all. Um, but the, the methods that were used by the Bush administration might have been proved useful in the future as well had they been continued. Yeah, and had they remained classified. Part of the effect that they had had to do with the fact that they were classified. And um, at, on at least two occasions, um, Al-Qaeda operatives came into the custody of the CIA, and as soon as they knew in whose custody they were, their reaction was, I've heard of you guys, I don't want anything to do with this, and they disclosed what they knew. It wasn't necessary to resort to anything. And had, had these... Other than pretty please. Right. And had these, had these been still in use, um, could they have been used on other members of Al-Qaeda who have since been killed by drone attack? Uh, and would it have been more valuable to capture them and, and use these methods, like what was done with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? Sure. Um, I mean, you don't have to go as far as, as uh, people killed in drone attacks. There was a man named Abu Motalib right. who was caught um, on Christmas Day in 2009, right, I think, about to get to over, that, yeah. over Detroit, yeah. um, trying to blow himself up. And the Times Square attempted bombing. And the Times Square attempted bombing, right. 
And so in your view, they should be subjected to the full range of... We wouldn't have needed it. Um, the fact is that we knew enough in both instances um, to have gotten information from them that would have been enormously valuable. Um, in Abdul Muttalib's case, it would have prevented uh, various package bombs that were destined for the United States from being put on airplanes that could have exploded and didn't. Um, because the, 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 um, the explosive that he was carrying was the same as the one that went into those printer cartridges um, that later showed up on, on, uh, on airplanes headed for the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, that could have been stopped had we found out who put him on that airplane and where he was trained. And now we don't know any of that? No. He's just... And if we know gone. it, it's far too late because whoever it is has already gone to the weeds. Right. Um, I mean, the same mistake making adjustments was made when, when, um, when bin Laden was killed and um, the president then not only disclosed that he was killed, which is fine, uh, but also that a trove of information was found um, in, his, in his hideout and that various CIA black sites, or not CIA, but, but um, various, various um, Al-Qaeda safe houses were, the location of various Al-Qaeda safe houses was discovered. Well, you, you tell me how long it took people in those safe houses to change their address. Why do they, what, what possible reason would they have for announcing that? Um, you know what a Balgaiva is? Yeah. Um, now, it, you've spent, you spent, as a judge, an entire career involved in cases, many having to do with national security. Now, all of a sudden, you're attorney general. Now you're getting daily briefings on national security threats, etc. So did anything change in your view, in your perspective, once you enter this job? Yeah, quite a lot. What can, you, what can you tell us about that? When I got there, I thought that was at least one subject that I knew something about, but the daily briefings changed my view of that substantially. Um, I had not realized, well, there were two things, but it was good news and bad news. Uh, you never, it's never all bad news. Right. Um, the, the, the bad news was that it was um, much more varied, uh, much more widespread, and uh, in a way much more resourceful than I had ever thought. On the other hand, um, our way of getting at it uh, was also much more resourceful than I had imagined. So we, we were very good at gathering intelligence. That's the good news. Principally electronic intelligence. What's the bad news? The bad news is that it's, there's a lot of it out there. People who want to kill And them. that, yeah, and that um, they use, I mean, they, they, may, they may have a seventh century point of view, but they use 20th, now 21st century techniques. Um, and are very good at adapting themselves to uh, detection me methods that we have. Now, uh, people always talk a little bit, if we can, about um, detention as well as uh, military tribunals. Uh, people often uh, see you as someone who's the poster, uh, poster man, if, I will, uh, if, you, if you will, of uh, the Bush administration's policies in the war on terror. Which now, is interesting because yeah. none of them were instituted when I was When you were there, office, right. But not only that. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to pose for the poster. Right, okay. Not only that, but you actually, um, in one of their earliest cases, um, pushed back at some of what, the, in the Padilla trial, at some of what the Bush administration sought to do. Is that correct? Or is that, can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Um, Padilla, and that, that is the fact that, that was then the correct pronunciation as his lawyer, his oh, lawyer told me. Oh, it's no longer the correct pronunciation? No, he now goes, he now prefers Padilla. Okay. But then his lawyer told me it's, it Padilla. rhymes with gorilla. I see, Padilla. okay. Um, so let's just explain to the audience who he is. So it's 2002. He is, um, he is a, um, he was born in the United States, lived in Chicago, not lived in Chicago, but he lived principally in Florida, uh, was convicted of murder, uh, did his time, left went on a journey of self-discovery that took him to Saudi Arabia and a number of other places. Um, eventually wound up um, in Afghanistan um, as a member of Al-Qaeda. And um, he was trained along with a Brit named Biyam Mohammed, um, who I'll get to in a minute. Uh, Padilla came to the United States, landed in Chicago. Uh, the, the, the 
big story at the time was that he had come to build or to get material for a dirty bomb, um, which was actually kind of a fanciful scheme that he had. Actually, he was, he was there to do something a lot more prosaic, which was to get um, buildings in, or apartments in, um, in buildings in Florida, seal them up, uh, turn the gas on, and then detonate them simultaneously using, using telephones. Um, and he was, he was intent on, on doing that. And, he, he, and they he, knew this from intelligence? Otherwise. Yeah, they knew this from, right, um, from intelligence that was gathered um, from a number of people, including Abu Zubaydah. And um, when he got to the United States, he was, he, was, he was carrying the money that he had gotten on the meal that he shared with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and a number of other people just before he left. And um, he was arrested on what was called a material witness warrant, um, which allows the government to take somebody into custody who has evidence of a crime, but is not likely to be available to either a trial jury or a grand jury to testify for whatever reason. And it allows them to pick him up, and theoretically for the purpose of putting him in front of a grand jury. And I issued that warrant. He was picked up in Chicago, was brought to New York, given a lawyer, as all people arrested on material witness warrants are. And um, we then, there was then a kind of back and forth about what was going to be done with him. And eventually I told the government, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a um, preventive detention statute in this country. You're going to have to fish or cut bait. Either you put him in front of a grand jury or charge him with a crime or let him go. And I got a call um, on a Sunday morning that um, the U.S. attorney wanted to visit me that night. Uh, he did, and told me that uh, the president had designated Mr. Padilla as a, uh, an enemy combatant, and that there were people on their way from um, uh, the brig in Charleston, South Carolina, to take him into military custody, and he, the U.S. attorney, wanted me to dissolve the material witness warrant. An enemy combatant means for somebody working for an enemy with which we're at war? An unlawful enemy combatant is somebody who um, is working for somebody with whom we are at war and is not following the laws of war. When, um, in 1942, uh, there were two groups of German saboteurs who landed, one on the island, the other in Florida. Um, they were um, apprehended. They were here for the purpose of committing sabotage. And um, interestingly, they landed in uniform because they thought that if they were captured during the landing, at least they would be able to say they were following the laws of war and, and they were they in uniform. The status of POWs. They had the status of POWs. They buried their uniforms on the beach. Um, they were eventually rounded up a couple weeks later. And um, all of them were, were, they were tried before a military court, notwithstanding that the civilian courts were, uh, were sitting. They were tried before a military court in Washington. And um, out of, I think, 12 or 13 of them, all but two were executed. They were tried by? They were tried by a military commission military. as unlawful enemy combatants because they had landed out of uniform and were intent on committing sabotage. So now the, now the U.S. Attorney tells you that Padilla, the President has designated Padilla an, enemy, an unlawful enemy combatant. Right. Now what? The following Tuesday, um, his lawyer showed up in court and no Padilla. So she said she was going to file He's a... Now in, in the brig. In he the, was now in the brig in Charleston. Uh, she said she was going to file a habeas corpus petition in his behalf. The government conceded the fact that he had the right to file a habeas petition, but said he should have filed it in South Carolina. And that means what, in other words? That allows him to challenge the lawfulness of holding him in custody. Nothing more than that. Just whether it's lawful, whether the president is authorized to hold him in custody as an unlawful enemy. And the government granted him that right? Government didn't grant it. The, I mean, the, he had it under he the Constitution. It. The government conceded that he had it. What I Because said, he was an American citizen, in other words? No, because he was or, in custody here. Okay. Um, and because, yes, and because he was an American citizen. Right. Um, the, um, what, I, what I said also was it was not feasible for him to file a habeas petition from a brig someplace, or indeed from any place else, without the assistance of a lawyer. And so I said he had to be able to be given a lawyer, not because he had a right to it, but simply because the only way he could file the habeas petition that the government conceded he had a right to was to talk to a lawyer. And so in aid of exercising my jurisdiction as a judge, 
I directed that he be given access to a lawyer solely for the purpose of preparing a petition. But not that you, you were open to the possibility that he did not have the right to a lawyer? As a general matter, correct. And you would take, as a judge, you take the president's word for it if he says he's an unlawful enemy combatant? No, what I said, what I said right. was that um, the standard that I said, I mean, there, there were no, the question was what's, by what standard do you judge what the president has done? Right. Um, what I said in that opinion was that all it would take from the government was a showing of some evidence that he was an unlawful enemy combatant. Not a preponderance of evidence, certainly not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I said this is the lowest standard, by the way, right. that in any proceeding in any federal court, some evidence. And then based on that, you could hold such a person, according to the law, indefinitely. Correct. Now, so to speak about branding, and okay. are, we, are we at war? When we say of a war, there's a war on terror, is that like a war against Nazi Germany, or is that like a war on drugs, or that's a, that's a real war? It's more like a war on Nazi Germany than it is like a war right. on drugs. There is an authorization for the use of military force that was passed by Congress that specifies certain groups and people against whom the president is authorized to use force. Being authorized to use force means being authorized to use force successfully. And that can involve even just detaining them, etc. Well, interestingly, that statute doesn't say anything about t detention. Uh, the courts have held that implicit in the use of force is the power to detain. There is currently before Congress um, an amendment to the statute that authorizes detention, sets standards for it. And interestingly, the administration has opposed that legislation. Um, Congress favors it. Um, because what we are now doing is detaining people without any standards whatsoever, which I think is a mistake. And, and, and if we had this statute on the books, then we would have standards for Correct. We would, know, we would know, for example, who we can detain. We would know what level of proof it took to show that that person was the kind of person we wanted to detain. There's a whole series of questions right. that are not answered by any statute at all, which judges are essentially making up as they go along. Now, in your, in your opinion, having been there, is Guantanamo a success? in terms of what America hoped to achieve by establishing it? Depends on how you measure success. Is it a facility that we could still use and should still use? Yes. Um, it is remote, secure, and humane. Can't think of anything better. So what's not? That sounds like it is a success, then. It's a, it's, talk about branding. Yeah. Um, right. There's been a problem about branding. And, the but, and there's also a problem because the current administration will not use it. Well, it's being used right now, right? No, it isn't. It's being used only in the sense that the people there are still there. But Nobody. no new people are Correct. Right. So what's happening to anybody else now captured, etc.? They're in a federal prison. Interesting question. Either they're in a federal prison um, or, as in one case, um, they were on a ship for a couple of months which, by the way, is specifically banned by statute. Just because they were so dedicated not to using Guantanamo. Precisely. Um, can't take them to Bagram anymore because we're getting out of Afghanistan. Aborted only I mean, because, why was that aborted? Because of the outcry? Because of no, the lack it was of aborted funds the, for it? What, what was, the what, plan to bring them to the United States. Well, the plan to bring them to the United States was aborted because, of, uh, because Congress exercised the power of the purse and said, Cut off funds for it. Correct. You can't spend any money to bring anybody from Guantanamo here. What are your thoughts as someone who's presided over a trial in the Southern District of New York of a terrorist, of several, many terrorists, about the idea of bringing it to, uh, bringing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to Manhattan? Disaster. Why? Lots of reasons. Um, start, actually, with a, with a moral reason. Um, and that is that the, the laws of war have developed over the past several hundred years for the purpose of trying to civilize it to the extent that we can. We have very simple rules. You wear a uniform, you follow a recognized chain of command, um, you carry your arms openly, and you don't target civilians. If you do all of that, then when you're captured, you can be treated as a prisoner of war and held until the, the close of hostilities. What you say by bringing him to the United States is, if you violate all of those rules, we got an even better deal for you. We bring you to a US courtroom, we appoint a lawyer for you. We give you a platform to sound off about your beliefs. And the Blythe Sheikh did use your court 
as a platform. Um, during sentencing, he did, yes, uh, or tried to. I mean, I let him, I let him run on for an hour, which was a lot longer than I thought I would. Able to do right. We're, we're, we're about to celebrate Purim. Now, at the heart of this holiday is not just a commemoration of salvation, but a celebration of the downfall of our enemies. But, but just uh, yeah, sure, I'm sorry. Round yeah, the corner of that. Sure. On the last sorry, answer, yeah. In addition to the moral yeah. point that I made um, about why it would have been wrong to bring Khalid Sheikh Mohammed here for a civilian trial, as a practical matter, um, it would have been enormously costly. It would have shut down Lower Manhattan for months, if not years. Um, and it would have put an even bigger target on this city, which is quite big enough, thank you very much. Now, so, and so nothing is happening with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. No. He's being, no, he's being tried before, he's, gonna, he's going to be tried before a military commission when they get done with Nashiri's trial. Nashiri is on trial now. Right now. Is there a chance that they will execute them, or you don't think so, or you don't know? Um, am I going to live long enough to see it? I hope. Um, it'll be a close, sort of a, tie between that and the Second Avenue subway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're about to celebrate Purim, Judge McCasey. At the heart, as I mentioned, of this Yom Tov is not just a commemoration of salvation, but a celebration of the downfall of our enemies. We actually hoot and holler many people when we read about Haman's hanging. Um, it seems that part of Judaism's celebration uh, is that we despise the egregiously evil and we rejoice at their facing justice. As someone who stared evil in the face, uh, and whose very life may have been under threat, uh, I'm wondering how you experience Purim, and if you could uh, speak about that just a tiny bit. I experience it just that your, way. Your name Mordechai aside. I mean, my, name, a, my name yeah. aside. Um, yeah. I experience it just that way. And I think that there is nothing, um, there's nothing base, there's nothing objectionable about that reaction to inflicting ultimate penalties when they're appropriate. Um, and that we shouldn't mask it um, and make it aseptic um, in the way that we do, because it it, it robs um, I think it robs an essentially human element and human reaction and a perfectly justifiable reaction, um, and sort of wraps it in a in a in a, in a wrapping that um, that I think is distasteful to most people, uh, and they have every right to feel distaste for it. When you were running this trial, the, the blind sheikh trial, I was, um, well, I was 16, 17, 18. I, Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're precocious. Um, as you mentioned, this is really my concluding question, uh, on the other side of the United States, a, a different trial was going on, uh, the OJ trial. Now, um, I knew who Judge Ito was, but I didn't know who Judge Michael Mukasey was. Which is fine, thank you. Yeah, yeah my apologies in, in retrospect. I was from Achila and Erev Yom Kippur when we see each other before Slichas. But, um, but that says something. It says something about uh, the type of country we were then, uh, I think. And my question is to you now, has the country changed? Uh, it's said that people say this all the time. On September 11th, everything changed. Do you really think that's true? Have we changed culturally? Should we change? Are we alert to the, the real threats that are out there? Or are we still more interested in American Idol than Judge Michael Mukasey? Look, um, I think people should be much more interested in American Idol than Judge Michael Mukasey. <laughs> Any day of any year. Uh, well, I'll have to agree to disagree on that. Um, there's, a, there's a limited degree to which people can walk on eggs every day of their lives and focus themselves on impending disaster. And I don't think it's, I mean, it's long term, it's not healthy. Um, I think we've changed in the sense that we're much more aware of the problem. I think people are now getting to be much more open about discussing it, which is all to the good. Um, but um, Whatever I mean, whatever cultural changes have taken place, um, I don't think have anything to do with with 9/11, uh, which is also all to the good. So that we're in, we're in okay Look, shape, in other words. Um, we're in reasonable shape. I think that um, a lot of people have lost sight of what happened that day. I think to a large degree, 
the media are at fault, both because they don't ever show pictures of what happened that day, and because even on the 10th anniversary, the way it was referred to was as a, as a tragedy, as if it had been a flood or a fire or some other natural disaster, and the notion that there were wicked people who did something horrible to us um, and whose followers um, we have to be on guard against was something that was, as far as I recall, completely absent from the, 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 the commemorations um, that I think should have been present. On that note, I want to thank you for helping us prepare very meaningful for Purim this year, Judge McCasey, and thank you so much for joining us here this evening.